All right, well, welcome everyone. It's three o'clock and we've got another excellent event on tap for you. I know there'll be a few people still trickling in uh, as we go here, but uh, to reintroduce myself, I think most of you know me by now, Anthony Derby, I'm an advisor with the group. And I was so excited you could be here because I think this is really gonna be a good use of your time. We have two excellent guests um, and who deserve special thanks for taking the time out of their day to present to us. Um, First, and you may hear from him in the questions part, is Matt Mosslender, who's a regional VP for JP Morgan and also a client advisor. And he's a really great resource for us, which is why we feel incredibly lucky to be able to share some of his knowledge with you. And then uh, secondly, but not least, in fact, first and most important, is Sharon Carson, who is here to not only walk you through the information we have today, and it's all about if I was going to put a title on this, which is hard because we're going to cover so many important topics, it's she's an expert on guiding people through retirement. And that's actually, she's a retirement strategist with JP Morgan, and she's on the Guide to Retirement team, which if you don't know, is actually a free resource. We use it all the time in the office, but it's out there on the web. You can look at it. It's got all the data you could possibly want. And Sharon's going to go through some of the selected slides and talk about all the different things. And, and we feel incredibly fortunate to have both of them here, uh, especially Sharon, doing the presentation for us. So with that, Sharon, uh, take it away, and I will pull the slides up so you can start uh, going through the data here. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. So we'll start with the agenda, so the agenda page. And there's three things on the agenda. One is... Uh, plan for a long and rewarding life. So it's not just, um, you know, it, your money is going to affect your life and your life affects your money, of course. So getting those two together is really important. And then right hand in hand with that is retirement spending and income basics. So we have several slides on the spending and then a few slides on the income. And then to wrap it up, I've got one slide on investments that's just a perennial favorite, so I had to include it, which is using time to your advantage um, on investing. So with that, we can uh, go ahead and take a look at our life expectancy probability chart. So here, actually, I want to set this up for a second um, before you look too much at the slide. One thing I want to say about this is um, think about um, you know, the longer you live, the longer you live because you survive so far. So our chart starts at 65 uh, and then a probability of living to a certain age or beyond. And the or beyond is really important because you don't want to plan to the midpoint of your retirement journey. Um, if you just plan to the midpoint, half the people are going to go beyond that. Um, if you think about a median um, or even, in, you know, if you think about an average, it, it could be close to half the people will go further than that. So you want to get to the end of your retirement journey. And I can't resist telling a little story. My husband years and years ago was saying, you know, oh, we, you know, my aunt doesn't have that much longer to live. And you may think family history is destiny, right? That's going to be you know, you, because, you know, he's saying, you know, everybody in her family had heart disease and Aunt Jay, his, who is beloved up in Rhode Island, not going to live that long, um, you know, in her 80s. Just last November, he's saying, you know, I got to take mom and dad up to see Aunt Jay because it was November 11th, <laughs> the pandemic. <laughs> But we can't miss it. We can't say wait to next year because it's her 100th birthday. And Aunt Jay is still with us. She's outlived everybody in her family. This is about 15 years after my husband made his prediction <laughs> and said she's outlived everybody. So it just goes to show you we have new medical technologies. You may live longer than you think. So you got to plan for this. So if looking at the chart finally, you know, women are the colorful ones here. We're in purple. The men are in less than colorful. They're in gray. And then couples, one or the other, are in green. Seven out of 10 women who make it to 65 are going to, they're going to live um, to 80 or beyond. And six out of 10 men. And of couples, nine out of 10, one or the other. And then 90 years old, three out of uh, 10 women, two out of 10 men, and half couple of couples, one or the other would live to 90 or beyond. So there's a really good chance that you might have 
a really long life. So what are you going to do with, with all this time, the time bonus that you're going to get in your life or your potential time bonus? Um, are you going to spend that working? Are you more interested in not working? Um, is it financial freedom? How are you going to fund all of these years? So that's some of the things we're going to tackle. And let's actually go into looking at work. And some people actually uh, work in retirement. On the next page, you will see here that the, at least before the pandemic, now this could change after the pandemic because people might reevaluate. They might say, I have the financial freedom to quit, so I'm going to. And you've been seeing some of that in the press. But pre-pandemic, the number of people 60 between 65 and 74 creeping up a little bit in terms of how many are working, but not everybody is working because they have to. Some people are working because they want to enjoy it. It's a different opportunity. They're trying a new career. They're staying active and involved. And that's what you want. If you're going to work in retirement, which not everybody will, because still the majority are retiring and not working anymore. But if you are going to work, you want it to be your choice. And that's always what you want to strive for. You, you know, other people are buying extras or making ends meet, um, which is fine. At least they're able to do so. Um, and then you can give more than one answer. So these do add up to more than 100. So if you have all this extra time, some of you might be working, some of you might not. What else might fill your time is really on, on the next slide. We could take a look at that. And here we, what you would see is a lot. People are sleeping a lot more than I would expect in this time use survey. At least they're reporting they are. I don't know who these people are that are getting eight hours of sleep a night, but I love my parents. They take a lot of naps. So maybe as you get older, this starts to become more true. Work does eventually start to taper off. Um, those people who do work do tend to reduce their hours. So you do see that in the purple bars on the bottom. But then the social leisure and exercise really goes up. And, it, and unfortunately, it's that TV watching that seems to be going up the most. But if you want a happy and healthy retirement, you want to stay connected to other people. So maybe if you're getting together with family and friends or you're all talking about the, the, a special show that you watch together and that's connecting you with, with people, that would be a good thing. But if it's just TV on your own, hopefully you can find more ways and more things to do with your leisure time that will bring you more satisfaction and more connections with others. Um, studies have shown that that helps you live longer and, and you feel better and it's just a really good thing. So thinking about your leisure time, what you're going to do, even before you retire, if you're not retired yet, how are you going to spend that time? Uh, what kind of, you might want to try out some hobbies or try out some new things to do. You might want to volunteer. You can see the, the volunteer also does go up, which is good, but only about a fifth of the people do volunteer. Um, so that's something, if you're not working, you might be volunteering. You might be doing something else that you really love to do with your time that can help you identify with who you are and what you like to do. And of course, unless it's a very low cost activity, this is why it's also important to think about this and maybe try out some things before retirement is, you know, some things that you like to do, like maybe you love to ski or travel or something like that could cost money. And you want to make sure that your financial plan reflects the fact that, you know, you're going to have to spend that money. Or if it's a very low cost activity, like visiting your grandkids across town and you're going to have your mortgage paid off and everything else, that that gets factored into your plan. So you want to make sure uh, that those things are, are there right, which really heads us right into our next agenda slide, which is the spending and income basics. So this is definitely going to depend on who you are and what you want to do with that time. Uh, one of the things you have to think about, though, is as we can go to the next slide, is inflation. And we just had, um, you know, many years of extremely low inflation. And then we just got a little uh, spike recently uh, that may not be such long lasting. But even with low inflation over a very long period of time, that can erode your purchasing power and particularly for healthcare. Healthcare, you tend to use more as you get older. And so it is a faster inflating good than other goods. So even when inflation was low, healthcare tends to go up more. 
and then you use more as you get older. I think about it for myself. You know, I feel like I hit 50 and the warranty just expired. I started, I start falling apart. So that seems like that's happening with me. I don't know if anybody else feels that, or you, you could look at your, your parents or, you know, yourselves and say, gee, you know, healthcare can be expensive. Housing costs, right? You may pay off the mortgage, although more people are carrying debt into retirement. So that's something to think about if you're going to be doing that. Uh, making sure that's in your plan. Um, but other costs like property taxes and utilities can go up even when you're retired. In fact, if you were at home all the time and now now you're or you're, you were in the office, you, you may have seen this during the pandemic as well. Your utility bill may have gone up. You needed uh, internet, more internet bandwidth and all kinds of things like that. Um, those utility bills can go up. Um, but other costs can go down. And that's what we can really look at next on the next page is how does this whole picture uh, look together? And generally speaking, um, people spending does tend to decline as they get older. This is from uh, data from what's a survey. It's a government survey called the Consumer Expenditure Survey. And you, you do see housing is still a, a very big chunk. I think that's a property taxes and maintenance and utilities is a big reason. There's also anybody who rents in, are in there. And so those, those expenses go up, healthcare goes up, charitable contributions go up, but a lot of the other expenses go down, uh, particularly if your household size goes down. So this does take into account that children eventually leave home um, people tend to reduce their expenses after their peak earnings years, which are in their 40s. And also, you know, you don't have the community expense, the dry cleaning expense, some of the payroll tax expense. Uh, so some of those things can go down and really how much more furniture and how many more dining room sets are you going to get as you get older? You know, <laughs> eventually you may, may not buy as many of those. So thinking about all of that, you know, this is something your financial advisor could also take into account. Are you going to keep up with inflation? Um, the important point to think about if you think, gee, I'm, I may not keep up with inflation in my spending years, is what about those later years? And let's take a look at the next slide. Um, this is something that a financial advisor found with his own clients. He was called Michael Stein. And he wrote this book in that many years, it's a couple of decades ago now, and here's the, you know, the prosperous retirement. He said with his own clients, they seem to have this active phase, a slower phase where they did decline in their spending, but then they might have some higher healthcare expenses at the end, some long-term care expenses. So that's something that can be really important to plan on. You know, if you are planning to keep up with inflation or maybe your travel budget would eventually fall off. I know if my parents, traveled all the way up till I think 80 and then, you know, world traveling, not just, you know, local travel. Um, but now that's falling off, but some long-term care uh, costs are picking up. So maybe it's substituting one cost for the other at some point as well. But how do you plan for those long-term care costs? How likely is it? How long might you need it? I think our next slide can address some of that. Here you'll see most people are probably going to need some type of long-term care. And this is defined as assistance with two or more activities of daily living. For women in the purple, it's more than the men. Um, you know, the men tend to die sooner. So I guess there is a, a disadvantage to that, but maybe the advantage is they, may, they don't need as much long-term care. Also, spouses, uh, if a spouse can help you, a lot of times um, women are the younger spouse. They may be helping um, their husbands and so forth. But three quarters of women, 64% of men, some type of care. Um, and a quarter of men and about 20% of women, it's only unpaid care with family and friends. Some need some paid home care. Um, some need nursing home, some assisted living. Sometimes there's a pro progression of care from one type to the other. You may start out with a few hours of paid home care and then you need more later. So it's not necessarily uniform and, and you just could end up, you know, moving a, a little bit across the spectrum. Um, down at the bottom, for how long might you need it? Well, luckily, you know, almost half the men are going to be less than two years. So that's really good. 
and uh, you know more than a third of the women less than two years. But on the other end, it gets much much scarier, right? Three in ten men and four in ten women are going to require it for four or more years, and you even have eight or more years for some people. Uh, so that can be rather daunting. And when you think about this, okay, this is, you know, what do you want to plan for? Do you want to plan for the most um, common, -ish, you know, things, which is, you know, closer to probably the couple of years or maybe three years for women? Or do you want to plan for sort of tail risk, which is what we call, the, the nerds uh, call sort of that extreme event, you know? And what can you afford to plan for? And what are some of the solutions that can be brought to bear? We can look at the next page um, to address that. Some of the possible solutions, of course, your family can help you, but you may need to consider in your plan, do I need to move closer to family? If you're all the way across the country from your family, I know, luckily, right before uh, they became more frail and needed more help, uh, we were so fortunate that they decided, my parents decided to move closer to us. So thank goodness, but the East Coast is a lot more expensive than where they were living before. So they had to adjust for that. Um, savings, you may have savings that you could fund, uh, can fund some of your care. And uh, I already mentioned some of your other expenses like travel or your, your mortgage or, you know, that could go away. Uh, insurance options and your financial advisor could talk to you, but there could be many insurance options and not just long-term care insurance, but it could be even insurance for a surviving spouse like life insurance or something like that tends to be most effective if you look at that option when you're healthy because it can be harder, much harder to get when you're not healthy anymore. And like I say, the, the warranty can ex start expiring in your 50s pretty easily. And then life plan communities, my aunt and uncle are in one of these. Um, it's You start an independent living and you have your own place and then you progress, if you need it, to other types of care and there's different ways to pay for it, different types of contracts. Um, MyLifeSite.net is a, is a great resource to help you try to evaluate those communities if you're interested. And then home equity, if you have a second home or perhaps some home equity uh, in your home that can be used to pay for your care, that's an option. Uh, a lot of people ask about Medicaid. Make Medicaid. It can be hard to qualify. It can limit your care options. And we would really say, you know, rules are going to vary by state. Um, if you're really interested in this, you probably would need an elder care attorney, but generally speaking, the way I tend to think of it is, it's really for if you've exhausted your other options. You're not gonna have uh, much assets and uh, income left to, to be able to use Medicaid. And, and I would expect as the government and the budget gets more stressed that that's gonna become even harder uh, to use in the future. So just something to watch out for there. And long-term care is pretty depressing. So because of that, I said, I've got a couple of happiness slides, so let's not just be too depressed. Let's talk about spending to be happy too. What can we, yes, you need to plan for those, you know, things like long-term care, and that's really important, and I would encourage you to do, do it, but also thinking about, and I talked a little bit about spending money to connect to others, and what can really, bring people the most joy. This, this came from a book called Happy Money, and it's a buying experiences, not things, is what uh, the data and the scientists have shown. Like if you get the fancy car versus the regular car and you're stuck in traffic, the fancy car is not really, the BMW may not be making you that much happier than the Honda Accord, right? But, you know, if you went on this super memorable dinner or ski trip with family or friends or camping or whatever you like to do with others, it's the experience. It can, it can actually help define who you are as a person. And that's your memories of that can improve as time goes on. And it's not something you can easily compare with another option and it's not something that you would give up. If you think about the most special times in your life, would you, would you ever trade them for anything? You wouldn't because, because of that. So thinking about you know, your budget, and, or not necessarily your budget, but how your, because budget can be a bad word for some. Some people like to budget and other people hate it. So I generally try not to use the word budget. But if you think about your spending plan in retirement, 
um, then, then you want to think about, you know, how do I budget in or how do I think about spending? I just use the word again. If you think of how am I going to plan for these things that are going to be most important and most memorable to me? Uh, so that's what you want there. And then the other thing that can make people happier with money is on the next page. Um, so here is who is happier. They did this experiment, and this is a step through slide. So they went to people and they said, how happy do you feel this morning? And these people agreed to be part of the survey. And then the next thing they did is they gave the people an envelope with either $5 or $20. And then also there was another step here, which is we told people, okay, you can spend it on you or you can spend it on somebody else. So A, B, C, or D, spend on you, spend on somebody else. And $5 or $20, you got four permutations. Who was the happiest in the evening when the researcher called back? Well, it didn't matter whether you got five or 20 bucks. What really mattered was you spent it on somebody else in terms of happiness in the evening. So I think, you know, this is something to also talk to your financial advisor about. Do you want to have a gifting plan? And, you you know, maybe it's a tax advisor too. Do you want to have a gifting plan? during your life or, you know, after, you know, if there's money left over, you know, is that going to help you increase your happiness and satisfaction with your life? And is that part of your plan as well? So you can think about that too. And so now we've covered all the spending, including the depressing stuff and the happy stuff. Now we're going to move to the income side next. Um, and one thing that comes up on the income side is social security and is it even going to be around. So, and it is scary because of what we have on this chart. And I'll just explain this chart. So we have um, OASDI, that's a fancy term for old age survivor and disability uh, insurance. And so in other words, it's your social security benefits. So under the trustees immediate intermediate assumptions, you got 3.3 workers is what we used to have for every beneficiary. And you got to realize current workers are funding most of the program. Most of it's not coming from the trust fund. Right, the trust fund you hear all the time, it's gonna run out in 2033, 2030 was 2034, it's gonna run out, but mostly it's being funded by current workers. It's your current payroll taxes today if you're working today. But the problem is we're gonna have a lot fewer 2.2 in the future. We're going down in terms of number of workers to support. So not only is the trust fund running out, you got fewer workers. Now the good thing is we still have current workers. So there's actually enough with current payroll taxes to fund 75% or three quarters of the benefits through the long run projection period, even given the pandemic and everything that's happened. And even with the number of beneficiaries going down, you do see that a good chunk of social security benefits are gonna be funded anyway, just from continuing payroll taxes. So that is the good news. Now, for younger workers, and um, whether it's you or your kids or your grandkids, younger, higher earners, we do expect benefit cuts. The other lever that they could do is increase payroll taxes. Uh, we don't think they're going to decrease benefits for any current beneficiaries. Or if you're anywhere, you know, near 62, we think this is a few years off before they do with it, deal with it, because they generally don't deal with it until they have to, um, because they're afraid, and they're afraid of older people who do tend to vote. So that is why we don't think that current beneficiaries are in danger. If you were a legislature, wouldn't you like to push the cuts off on higher income people way out in the future? And historically that's what's happened and that's what we think would happen again, as well as you know, you can raise the, the payroll taxes and uh, take the cap off of the income for payroll taxes as well. So those things could be coming down the pike, but we don't think current beneficiaries will have anything to worry about. So bottom line, the closer you are to retirement, the less you have to worry about this. Um, so that's, that's good news if you're right on the cusp of your retirement plan in terms of income. If you're younger, you may have to make some of this up. So just be aware of that. So that's one uh, aspect of income. But that Social Security is not all you have, of course, in terms of your income. So let's go to the next slide and we'll look at, okay, some, this is one way that some people think about this. 
Um, if this appeals to you, you can talk to your advisor about it. You could cover perhaps your, your needs with pensions if you have, are lucky enough to have one, social security, protected lifetime income or annuities, um, some cash maybe, a high quality bond. So really protecting those needs and then your wants and legacy, you can take more risk to keep up with that inflation that I talked about and those increasing healthcare costs and maybe some of the long-term care costs when you get old, the part that's gonna be covered by your savings, um, you would want that to grow over a long time frame and not that purchasing power not to get completely eroded. So that this is one uh, way that some people do think about this. Um, there are other ways to deal with it and it really needs to be personalized to you. So I would suggest that you, know, you, you, you talk to your advisor how, how they would suggest and what you're comfortable with. Um, but actually some other approaches and other thoughts on this are actually on the next page. I'm almost done. I think I got a couple more slides and then I'll get to questions. So one thing that, you know, people in offices, uh, like I'm in an office, uh, you know, tend to think about is, oh, people are going to spend their money down to zero by the time, <laughs> you know, at the, at the end of their life. But some people don't like that idea. So it's important to you to, it's important to think about how you're going to work with your financial advisor about this. Do you have the wealth and ability to increase your wealth if that's your goal? And how much would that uh, call for sacrificing your lifestyle if that's what you need or want to do. Uh, do you want to preserve your principal? Um, there, I would just, you know, uh, send a note of caution. You know, just preserving your principal can cause you perhaps to stretch for yield. Um, and you want to watch out for stretching for yield. This is where a good financial advisor could really help you. Um, your, your principal, you know, if it's capital could also go down, even if it's invested for yield. So you, you got to watch uh, that. It's not necessarily a bad thing to, to spend a little bit of principal as opposed to just spending the income. It actually could be safer depending on what you're invested in. So you, that's something to talk about with your advisor. And then spending your principal, you could spend some of it, and there's different strategies to do that. Um, dynamic withdrawal just means you know, if you have some flexibility in your spending, you can adjust through time as you go. Protected lifetime income is annuity or a combination of both of those things. So this is what's really crucial to talk to your financial advisor about and see what's gonna be the most comfortable, best fit for you of these strategies because not, not one strategy is gonna work for everybody. And then lastly, and our last slide is one of my favorites, using time for your advantage to keep up with those high inflation costs, those long-term care costs at the end of life, staying invested uh, for that part of your portfolio that is invested is really important. Um, so this is impact of being out of the market, $10,000 invested through since 20, uh, 2001, so 20 years, including the Great Recession, dot-com bubble, even at the beginning of it, all kinds of tensions with China. We did extend this out, you're not seeing it, but we took a look after the pandemic, same exact story. So that 10,000 could grow to 42,000 four times. It's a, you know over a 7% annual return. You miss the 10 best days of the market, you're down to half. You missed another 20 best days, you're pretty much cutting it in half again, and then you start to go negative, the more best days you miss. One of the questions that we get on this is, well, what if I miss the worst days? And I tend to say, okay, tell me when the worst days are going to be, and then we'll make sure you're out. And nobody really knows in advance when those worst days are gonna be. But even if you knew when they were, even if you were smart enough to actually know when they would be, which would be really, really hard, you wouldn't know when to get back in because seven out of the 10 best days occurred within two weeks of the 10 worst days. And that happened after the pandemic too, when we ran this in April, the worst day was you know, one, of, one of the worst. And then the next day it bounced right back up and we had the best day. So that's something to really watch out for is you, know, you wanna think about this when markets are good. And then so you can remind yourself when the markets aren't so good, hey, I want to stay invested. I don't most necessarily want to jump in and out because jumping out at the wrong time and not knowing when to get back in 
can really cause me to miss some of the best days. And this is once again, where your financial advisor can, can help you with these, uh, this to stay on track and keep you on, on the right path. And with that, I'd love to turn it over to questions. Yeah, absolutely, Sharon. And and everyone, uh, the the preferred and, and best way to ask to ask, excuse me, questions. We'll do the answering. Um, is in the chat feature. Um, and certainly, if you've got a question for us or for Sharon that maybe you don't want to share or have answered publicly, please get in touch with us, and we can refer that question to them or give you our answer and their answer. Um, no problem with that. But you know, while you're, you're maybe thinking of your questions, I'm gonna kind of go back and take, go over some of the notes I was taking as Sharon was talking, and, and, and maybe we can build a discussion around that for a little bit, because the, the, the guide or the, the timeline we just took you on is sort of the, the big questions you should be thinking about, and therefore we should be talking about, as far as it comes to your retirement. And this is applicable whether you're retired or not, because the first thing that Sharon went over today was the life expectancy. I think that blows people's minds, Sharon, when they find out that couples who are 65, there's a 50-50 chance one of them makes it to 90. Um, obviously, that's just statistics, but you know, it's it's amazing what our world is these days where 90 year olds like your like your aunts that you were talking about at the beginning you can routinely see people living to 100 and that speaks to so many different options that need to be considered as far as income in retirement how are you going to make sure we don't outlive our assets that's kind of what your investments are right i always make the comparison that life insurance is insurance for if you die too soon your investments are your insurance for if you live too long, so to speak, if that were uh, something that were bad. Um, so we want to make sure that we're covering that. We need to prepare for you to live long, but also encourage you to enjoy life in the near term. And that was those happiness slides. I can't tell you how many times, people, that I talk to where I'm the one convincing them to spend the money. Um, I'm saying, hey, you saved for 40 years to get to this point. You've just retired, you're feeling good. We don't know what, what life is gonna deal us as far as health or longevity. Maybe it'll be a long time. We're certainly gonna plan for that, but maybe it won't be. And that's why I want you to enjoy the now. And people ask all sort of questions. That's, that's why I love the slides about the go-go versus the slow-go, because I think that's another thing that really surprises people is you're telling me that my expenses tend to go down in retirement, even maybe as healthcare becomes a bigger uh, piece of the puzzle there. I don't, I'm, I'm kind of just uh, throwing my thoughts out there, Sharon, but um, you know, any thoughts on, on how to think about that as a retiree sort of, wow, how I can expect my, my expenses to go down as I, as I live longer. How does that make sense? Yeah. So it could be, you know, you, you have, you're the surviving spouse. It could be just like I mentioned before, your kids have left home or hopefully need eventually need less support from you. Uh, it could be that, you know, like I said, you're not going to buy another new dining room set again. You, you know, I think about my parents, they're even, you know, like they don't, and their grocery bill has gone down tremendously because they don't even eat as much as they used to. Um, so, you know, all of those kinds of things um, can can reduce your finances. You're not commuting to work anymore um, if you're still working. So it's it's all of those types of things. And eventually, you know, their travel bu budget went down. I mean, they kept it up till they were 80. So that's a long time to keep world traveling. I mean, they went to Antarctica right before the pandemic. I mean, thank goodness they got back you know, before it hit, but of course I was sweating it, but, you know, but, you know, you know, you, so you just think about that. If you've got the travel budget, you know, that may be, you know, if you're planning for the long-term care that can help fund that. Like if you have a plan for your long-term care, maybe that could also make you more comfortable freeing up some of your spending. And there's no shame in spending some of your principal. Um, absolutely not. Um, and people shouldn't, necessarily view that as a, in a bad way um you know i mean it, it's gonna depend on what they're comfortable with but yeah you want to enjoy your life and 
um, I, I applaud you for, you know, making sure that, that your clients um, and the people on the line can get the most out of their life because that's what really the money is for. Um, it doesn't, you know, um, it, it could be good if you want to leave something to others. That's also one of the joys of life. But, um, you know, really being able to enjoy that life and gifting and maybe even gifting some while you're alive, um, you know, might make you happier. <laughs> so. No, absolutely. And, and I'm glad you brought that up as well. And please, everybody, um, again, if you've got a question, feel free to type it in the chat for us. I just wanted to reiterate that again. But again, if there aren't questions, I'll throw a few out there and then we'll we'll call it too. So either way. Um, but I'm glad you brought that up, Sharon, because that's another thing that I think we really try to emphasize is it's great to leave a legacy. I mean, that's a wonderful impulse, whether that's for your family or even a charitable legacy. But I love it when people can find a way to do parts of that legacy while they're still alive. And we've had people who have said, you know, I love taking, I, I want to be able to take the family, the extended families, maybe kids and grandkids on a trip in the future. I want that to be one of my goals so that I can enjoy it with them. Not that they're going to take a trip with the money I leave behind. You know, I want to be there with them to enjoy it. Or, you know, if you, if a charitable uh, contributions are something that's important to you. How can we find a way to build that into your plan for now? So not that giving for charity is about recognition, but so that you can see what your resources provide. I, I think there's a lot of gratification to be found about that. And switching gears for a second, and this is actually, it's a great question for both Sharon and Matt, but uh, maybe Matt can speak to this one. Um, Sharon, you brought up in the slides about how it hard it is to find yield these days. And let me translate that for the audience a little bit, which is how do we generate income in a world where interest rates are at the floor that they can be at? You know, it used to be those of you who remember back to the 80s and 90s, you could retire, put your money in the bank and live off that interest for the rest of your life. Uh, or, or at least we thought that was gonna be the case. That is not the case now where interest rates are so low and bonds, have really become not an income stream like they used to be, but an insurance policy against your stock. So Matt, as, as sort of on the investment side, I'll, I'll let you run with that. <laughs> you know, I think it's interesting and a lot of the conversations we're having right now is, is to where do we generate that income? You, you really hit the nail on the head, Anthony. And many of the uh, uh, individuals on this call right now experienced a falling rate environment or a bull market and fixed income since 1980. And you could just park your money in a simple corporate bond and get income and protection. And now it's that puzzle, right? Do we want income or protection? And there's a lot of different things we got to think about in that. And it's hard to paint fixed income with a broad brush, I always say. And that's why it's so important to work with a financial advisor because each one of us are going to have different goals, risk tolerance, time horizons. Some are wanting to solve for capital preservation. Some are wanting to solve for income. And I think the ultimate answer is, even though we expect rates to go up from here, um, and it's a very fluid situation, you could say, um, the fact of the matter is even a year, two years, potentially even three years from now, we'll still have negative real return and fixed income if we sit there and think about it. So I think it's a challenge. Um, it's a puzzle, right, that we all have to, to try to put together. But in reality the matter is we might have to start looking at alternative sources for income um, things like annuities are, are becoming more and more important and you could even hear dr kelly he's our uh, chief global economist who runs our guide to retirement um start talking about the importance of potentially looking at things like annuities and other uh, guaranteed income so it, again the the seat that you're in anthony and the, and the team uh, you do a tremendous job in, in helping navigate that for the clients yeah, well, well, thank you. And and I, I pulled us back to a previous slide that we went through, just so everybody can see. And uh, and you know, I know uh, we're getting close to 45 minutes here, and maybe we'll leave it at that unless some other questions trickle through. And please, you know, feel free to write those in, everybody. But um, it all comes down to, in my mind, what kind of a retirement you want to have, what kind of a life you want to have. Forget the word retirement for a second, because. Yeah. Are you someone, and I pulled this slide up for a reason, who wants to grow what you have and end 
you know, on your last day, have more than you did on your day you retired. Because that's totally a fair option. And wow, what a great gift to the next generation to be able to do that. That dictates a strategy. That sort of approach dictates a certain strategy that we'll work with you with to help you live well now. Because Sharon mentioned it when she went over this slide. We don't want you eating, you know, beans and hot dogs because <laughs> you're, you're watching your bank account go up and the number looks really pretty. Again, that number has got to be used for something. That's the purpose of, that you saved for. But if you're somebody who wants to grow, that's absolutely a reasonable goal, and we can help get you there. If you're somebody on the middle arrow here, and I'll call that the living off your interest crowd, you just want to live off the interest that your accumulated assets have generated. That's something we can help you manage too. But again, there are some pitfalls to watch out for there, which is what Matt just talked about. There's a low interest environment out there. The amount of safe interest that you can get these days is tough to find. So that may dictate, again, our strategy. Do we look at products that are guaranteed for their income, like annuities, like insurance contracts? Those things can all be done, but we've got to know, and what I'm getting at, I got to know which of these three people you are. Or maybe you're a little column A, a little column C, or a little, you know, and we got to build those things together because my first instinct is always going to be to put you first. And I have found with many people, that they don't put themselves first half the time. It's kids come first. Uh, So-and-so needs help with uh, you know, a down payment on a house or uh, I, oh, I really wanted to do this, but I don't know if I could afford that because of X, Y, or Z. I'm gonna be your advocate. You come in the room with all your different thoughts and, and desires and, and wishes for the future. And I'm gonna help figure out how to make it work for you. I get the question all the time, you know, hey, oh, I. Anthony, I really would like to remodel this part of my house. It's the bathroom, let's say. It's just, I don't like how it looks. It's dated. We haven't touched it since we bought the house 30 years ago. I really want to do it. And, you know, I think when eventually we sell this house, I'll be able to get the money out of it. So I think it's a good investment. I say, wait, 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 stop right there. I want you, again, assuming your financial situation can bear it, to remodel this bathroom because you are going to get the benefit from it. It's great that you might be able to increase the sale of the house value and it might turn into be a good investment, but don't do it for that reason. That's just a bonus down the road. Do it because walking into that bathroom every day while you're in this house is gonna make you feel better, is gonna make your life better. That's what I tell people, make the decisions based off how things make you feel and how your life progresses and what you want versus thinking about the next generation to the detriment of right now, or thinking about, wow, I think this might be a great investment so I can justify spending the money. I'll help you figure out whether, you know, the money is a good investment or not, or whether this is a good thing. But, you know, I want you to start thinking, everybody on this call, about how to maximize your own happiness and your own uh, experiences, because we talked about that a little bit earlier too. So I'll get off my soapbox here. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm looking, I don't think any questions have come through. Any, uh, Sharon or Matt, anything you wanted to put a bow on here? Otherwise, I think we'll call it. I think, I think that was a great way to wrap it up. Yeah, uh, you, you know, it's, it's about working with your clients about to help them with what they want in their lives to make their lives better. I think that's a great ending. Unless Absolutely. A well, and, and thank you so much, Sharon and Matt, for being here. This was Excellent. By the way, everybody, I should have mentioned this at the top. This is being recorded. So there's going to be a, a historical uh, document of this on our YouTube channel. So you can go back and look through any of these slides whenever you want. Also, we'll be getting out these slides to you via email. So you can look through. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, all the slides have the little JP Morgan logo on the bottom. I know I said this at the top. These and many, many more. I mean, if we went through all the slides in the JP Morgan Guide to Retirement, we'd be here for hours talking about it. So there's way more info, more info than you'd ever want. So maybe the easier way is just to get in touch with us and ask us the question, and I'll point you to the right resource, but way more info than you could ever want. You can just Google JP Morgan Guide to Retirement, and there's tons of great information. So again, I can't thank Matt and Sharon enough for being here. Uh, thank you so much for the time and the information and the expertise. We really appreciate it. Good. Great. My pleasure. Perfect. Well, I'm signing off for now, everybody. Thank you for being here, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks.